All right, today. Okay. Mr. Ward, I seem to have forgotten to replace your marker. Yeah, put my marker. Oh, oh. 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 That's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. All right. Stop. All right. Now, hey, um, here's what I want to talk about today. Um, I want to go through examples of of actual problems that use like decay and growth today, and talk about things that it's silly, but things that would apply to me and how I how I would think of a problem. I'll use my I'll use my fish thing as an example, which is totally silly. Um, we're in section 3.5 today. Do you have any radioactive decay problems? No, no, no. Uh, uh, we can make we can make a problem. Okay. What if we don't so, know the half-life? 3.5. You can't just make okay. something. Uh, I'll use the, they have a couple like decay and growth problems in the uh, book. I'll just pick one of those. Um, so we're going to talk about growth and decay problems. Um, and one of the other problems I want to talk about today was um, uh, bank accounts, vesting bank accounts. I don't know if we did one of those on, on Friday, but I'll at least talk about those. Um, and to talk about how to solve when you're missing a time. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the idea. So we're going to start with the... Uh, the, uh, the interest problems, so that's the, the bank account problems. So talking about you know continuously compounded or compound interest problems. Uh, so compound versus continuous. Okay, so we're gonna do an example of each of those today because that's gonna be in the homework eventually later this week, not today by any means. Today is just about some notes. Maybe, maybe by Wednesday this week. Maybe we get to there. I don't know. We'll maybe. see. We'll think about it. We'll, we'll kind of see. This is one of the last few sections in the book that I want to cover, um, just because I think we've covered almost everything else up till now. Uh, we'll kind of look at what 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 else I haven't covered with logarithms yet, just to make sure that we covered all of our bases. Uh, so if you think about that, tentatively, what I'm telling you is like tentatively by the end of this week we should start be reviewing for this chapter three test. No, I no. thought there wasn't a test. So, there is. So, um, we will probably start reviewing. So, seniors, uh, this week, this Wednesday, I promised you I was going to give you a practice guide for your semester test. Um, raise your hand right now, seniors. So, I know how many of the hands. One, two, three, four, five, five, four. Okay, so. So. There's only sometimes three. I'm pretty sure there's only three. It's me, and Dan. What? Okay, three. I'll make sure. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, this week I'll give a seniors. I'll give you guys your practice guide for the semester. Remember, for seniors, your semester test is the Monday of your last week. So it's um, you guys are out of here on like a Wednesday. Yep, the 14th is the last day that you guys take your semester test for me. You'll take it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday when you're in class because you have to be here. That's the day I send your papers and I want your books back that day. Um, so we check you in that day. Okay. Um, we'll probably do a book check here in another week, just to make sure everyone's got the right book number and seniors you haven't lost yours yet. That way you got a week to check. So. All right. Questions, comments. Perfect. All right. Here we go. Let's start with the interest problems. Once we're through that, we're going to talk about growth and decay. And I have three problems that I want to talk about with that. Because obviously, if you guys want a a radiate a, a radiation problem, I'll we'll make up one of those. Okay. Hey, shh. Okay, so let's talk about the first example here. We're going to talk about compound, uh, continuously compounded problem. This is something that we talked about on bank accounts. Yep, bank accounts. We talked about it last week. Um, but the, the goal here today is to talk about time frame. So let's say that I had, let's say that I had a twenty-five hundred dollar savings account. That's my principal. Let's make it two hundred and fifty. And the growth that we have on this particular okay. uh, bank account um, is, uh, the rate is, um, let's go 1%, maybe your bank is being very generous, so we're going 1%, uh, this represents 1%, okay? And what we're looking for is time, the time is the question mark because what I wanna know is how long would it take for that bank account to increase to maybe three grand? <coughs> okay. So, so three thousand bucks. That's what I want to know. My amount goes into. So this is this is the type of problem that's perfect for a logarithm, for solving logarithmic equations. Okay, because here's the idea. This is the this is the problem that we're looking at. 
That's the formula for a continuously growth problem. Okay. The three thousand is the amount I want to. I want to. What well, they say is the amount that I want the account to invest to, grow to. The principal is the amount that I'm throwing in that account originally. And the rate we're going to go one percent interest rate per time, which is kind of high for a savings account. Usually so they're half. Yeah, percent. minus a quarter. Is it quarter? Yeah. Jeez, that's small. So. Also, all right. So, okay. Actually, doing the math here, um, we divide the twenty-five hundred across. Um, when you divide that over, you're going to get three thousand over twenty-five hundred, and this will be equal to e to the zero point zero one t. Take the L line. Okay. Hold on. Okay. When you simplify this, it should simplify out to be 6 over 5 e to the 0 0.01t. Hey guys, I just talked to you, told you to stop talking, seriously. It's just making me mad that we don't have to stop. It's like 1.2. But if you want us to use it for action, it's Okay. Um, right now I'm going to go fraction because I want the exact answers. We can go decimals here in a minute. I know 1.2 is probably exact, but uh, for the final answer, I'll just believe it everything in fraction. <coughs> Um, now, at this point, to solve this problem, I have to figure out what time is, and then we'll, you know, do a decimal approximation of it. Um, what you do is you actually um, write this problem out, and you do the little circle method because we'll change it to logarithmic form. I think the easiest way I always think of logarithms is if they're using an e, you take a natural log of both sides. This, this one that I do, the natural log of the other side, six over five, and then. Um, drop the power down out front, and when you do that, what will happen here is, because that's the property of water, this is called power rule, you can drop the powers out front, if you have a natural log on it, or any type of log, I should say, natural log of E equals natural log of 6 over 5. This part right here is the number 1. So it's 1 times whatever that 0.01t is, because the natural log of E, what it actually stands for, it actually stands for this. It means log base E of E. That's what they're actually doing. And that's why you're trying to figure out what power you put on E to make E, you put 1 on it. That's why it's a 1. Um, but, so what we're left with here is this equals natural log of 6 over 5. And then what you can do, do is divide by the point one, point zero. And what you get in the very end is the time. And this would be the exact answer. That time is natural log 6 over 5 divided by 0 0.01. Make sure on this problem, if you're ever typing a calculator, it is super important to use correct parentheses in the correct spots. Uh, because if you forget to close the parentheses, it thinks that this 0.01 is in the actual parentheses with the 6 divided by 5, or even worse, if you don't close the parentheses, it thinks you're taking the natural log of 6 then dividing by 5, then dividing by 0 0.01, like you'll get very, very uh, different answers depending on which way you type it. Um, but to give you a time frame, you know, roughly, and this, again, this formula is used for years. That's what they use this formula for. Um, when we do those later um, problems, we can set any time we want for those other count problems. But for, for, for savings count, they always go in years. Um, so natural log, 6 divided by 5, close that parenthesis and divide by 0 0.01. And it tells me that this account can eventually grow there in 18.23 years. So having just 1%, not half a percent, the growth is way faster. Like I think we did a very similar problem to this in the very, very beginning of chapter 3. We and we talked about how to change like a, 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 like a $2,500 account to a $10,000 account. And it would take like 100 and some years. But when you change the growth rate, like the percents, they get their way faster. That's why having the, the better counts. And this is something that you want to think about, because maybe you need that money sooner than 18 years, obviously. That takes a long time to get there. Add more to the account so it's faster. And or choose a different type of investment, like go stock markets. Try to go other things where the, the outcome can be potentially way more violent um, in, its, in its peaks and valleys. Because maybe eventually you'll make a lot more money, or maybe lose a lot more, I don't know. So it just depends. Okay, questions about the growth problem. Okay, goal today is to show you growth and decay type of problems, other than, you know, with savings accounts and stuff. 
But to show you with like different formulas, things that actually use this stuff. What's the decay formula? So um, it's the same style, it's almost the same problem. Um, so we'll talk about it. It's All they do is they switch the P to be A of zero. And so we'll, we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about that. So, okay, so let's talk about this. This is the, this is the problem that I wanna talk about. Okay, and I want to talk about growth and decay and how it's related to this continuously compound problem. Okay, just to show you this. All right, this next formula is directly out of um, most research books. I think your textbook even quotes it. Wow. So um, let me get the right formula so I don't mess it up. It's pretty straight formula. The formula. Here it is. Okay, here's the formula I'd like you to have. This is for population. This is a population density problem. Um, and so this is what it has. A equals C over one plus little a e to the negative b t. That okay. is awesome. All right, what this formula is, this, this is the formula they use for, um, and this is probably in the one that I probably should have used last week. This is, this is a problem where it's, it's a population density problem where you're trying to figure out the infection rates of a population. So like, let's say, um, I know like one of the examples that Bill Gates just went online the other day on CNN and announced that he, he foresees in like the next 20 years will have a significant flu epidemic where, you know, they have, you know, flu outbreaks all the time, you know, whatever, everyone knows it. But he's talking about that, that the casualty rates of this particular strain of flu, because it's getting more and more resistant to, uh, to vaccines, that it will potentially have like... Um, over the U.S. population could potentially kill in one season 30 million people. What? Okay. Right now it's killing a couple thousand each year, but he says that in like the next 20 years, we could see you know a huge percent of population loss because it's it's yeah. So because it grows, the more people there are, the more the more risk there is. What? Are you gonna get this flu? Well, in theory, yeah. I mean, everyone would be potentially impacted yeah, by that because. You particularly. Uh, let's look at the percent. Okay, let's look at. Let's take a look at it. So here's the idea. Oh, population. Yeah. Let's say that the population of of this particular uh, situation that we're talking about, 300 million people. How good okay. That's like US. Because that is the it's US like roughly population. It's, I think it's yeah. almost like 4 million yeah. right now. So Let me give you the exact. It's like 318. Okay. Years okay. Uh, as you're looking that up. Bill Gates said we'll potentially have 30 million people die of the flu. 30 million. Okay. 325.7 million. So say it again. 325.7 million. Did you say that? 325.7. Lars, we need more of an exact number here. Let's just call it 732. Yeah, I have this itching feeling here on an electronic device. Suddenly researched. No, someone told me. Oh, okay. All right. So, 300 million, uh, 325 million, 700,000. All right, now, the other numbers here that they talk about is the, uh, the A in this particular case is the original amount that was infected. So, uh, like for instance, maybe, yeah, let's go small number. 12. Let's go 12 people got infected. Oh boy. One okay. plus 12. Um, the rate. Negative 1.5 oh, T. It's not 3 million. 33 million, by the way. Oh, he said 33 mil? Yes. Yeah, he did some weird quotes, yeah. That was something I saw this weekend, okay? All right, so kind of a kind of a weird number. So, and again, where do these numbers come from? Maybe we're starting with 12 people infected. Maybe the growth rate is, it's going one and a half per time. Well, it's not doubling, but it's like, it's, it's growing pretty, pretty fast over time, okay? So then what you do is you take these numbers and we can solve for t. So you would actually take this thing here, multiply it across, so we get that thing off the bottom of the fractions, we can solve for t. The whole point is to figure out time scale. Like how, how fast would this infect 30 million people? Would it be a year, would it be two years? If this were to like start now. Is this in terms of days or years? This is in terms of years. We could actually change this scale, like this formula. It can represent anything we need, but this particular formula is used for years. And it was globally, okay. it wasn't in the US. It's globally, globally, geez, that's still, that's still a big number. Yeah, I'm just saying, yeah, that makes like, sense. Okay, it's start, that's it's still starting seven in China. That's yeah. seven billion. Yeah, yeah seven still. billion, not 300,000. So can we do the actual, can we do the, the real, like make that seven billion? Okay, how about we do like a percent of the US? So like, if, 
30 million, 33 million people, um, 33 million people uh, divided by 7 billion. Uh, that's million. That's um, it's that's a little bit. It's almost half percent of the population. So there's more than isn't it closer to eight? Um, so this is what he said. So over the whole entire planet, it's about half a percent of the planet would die to the flu. Okay, that makes sense. That's taking 33 million divided by seven billion. So applying that same number to the U.S. population, seven point six one eight billion. Say again. Seven. Uh, I'll say it's seven billion six hundred yeah. eighteen. I'll just go seven. Million. So it's not going to go really exact. Seven, here. Six, but it's over. So I mean, it's over. Seven, six, six, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, it keeps eight, going up though. Okay, so, so what this number is? There's almost two hundred thousand births today alone. Wow. All right. Count giraffes. Okay. Hey. Right. So here. Hey. Here's a more accurate number for the U.S. Okay. So if we're going this population, what Bill Gates said, if it's if it's over the entire planet, we're gonna affect a million people like accurately. Okay, this would be the amount of people for the US have died if we're using his numbers. Okay? What why did Bill Gates devise this I could see formula? It being bigger, though. Um just because of the analytics. What is Bill Gates though? He's a college drop saying why does he do it? He does philanthropy work. So he, he probably deals with third world countries and probably that's probably the number one thing he thinks about. Is disease is, yeah, outbreak. disease cool. outbreak because the the countries he works with just don't have the the funding to actually support it, like to support research and to get vaccines. So he's talking. That's about, why he gives them. Money. Yeah, yeah, he, he does. Like he donates million almost all his money. I think they said by the time he dies, his family will only get a couple mil out of his billions, and he donates it the rest of to the human race. So it's like. That's a lot of money. Like he, he has like hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah. So I saw that he's donated like sixty okay. billion or something. All right. Crazy. Now, so I think he's doing. I think he's doing the right thing. He's trying to get people aware. But this is the actual numbers like that are involved here. So we multiply this over. So if you multiply this over, this is what we have. Okay, four seven. We're going to take it times one plus twelve e to the negative one point five t. And, and this is starting with 12 people being infected made in the U.S. Okay, and this is and equal to this is equal to 325, 700,000. All right, and what we're looking for is a time scale, like how long would it take to infect this many people? Okay, so um, instead of distributing this number through, I'm going to divide this number over because that that will get the t by itself really quickly. This is a shortcut for doing this type of problem. So we have this, T, we subtract, you know, this, this number over, which I'll do the numbers here in a second. Okay, we're going to subtract over that 1534047. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll subtract the one with it. That way we, that, that way we actually get um, the, the E by itself. So we subtract that number across, and if we do this correctly, if I subtract, you know, 325 million 700 thousand. Now let's see, that's 700 thousand. One more zero minus the 101 million 534 thousand 47, and I write that number down. Right? That seems like I way too big a number here. I'm gonna need that robotic. Okay. Um, we subtract the number one, and what we have here is this. So we have on this side, once I subtract that and I subtract the one, we have 324.165.952. We're going to divide that number by 12. And this will leave me with the E, which is, which, yeah, we'll be able to. So we divide by 12, we get 270, or I guess 2,701,000, oh wow, this is pretty good. Divide by 12. Oh, that looks really big. I don't think you typed it in right. It probably makes sense, it's really big. Yeah, it's 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 Yeah, So Yeah, it's big. 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 Yeah, it's big.
No, we divided by 12. We didn't divide by anything. Um, all right. So we take we take the natural log. We'll drop the power up front. So this is the shortcut. If you take the natural log of both sides, which is this, the 27 mil uh, 829.2, and we take the natural log of the other side, this 1.5 T will drop out front, canceling the E out, and I can divide by this. And that will give me a time frame, which is the number I want. Natural log, 27 mil, 13,829.2, and we divide by negative 1.5, and it says that in theory, in theory, 11 years. It's a long flu. Well, his numbers were somewhat accurate. He said within the next 20, 30 years, something like that, that potentially we could infect, you know, or this would be the mortality rate of, you know, the flu epidemic, that he said within the next 20 to 30 years. And again, I didn't use the exact world population. I said 7 billion, not 700 and something billion. But he said in the next 20 years, I'm saying about the next 11. That makes sense if that's roughly the growth pattern of the flu epidemic. What it's growing by? 11 years. 11 years. That, you know, potentially we're growing half a percent of the population each year. That's kind of scary. Mr. Ward, what do you we're think? We're talking within six months, 30 million people. Probably boot yeah. out, Probably. Mike. Did you watch the little. Uh, between the 75 and 200 million people? But they don't know how many. Oh. And that was when the population was significantly less. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the percents were probably a lot higher. said the plague of Justinian in 541 killed half the population of Europe. Whoa, that's they serious. 25 million people in the okay. 540. All right. Hey, hey, last example. Last example that I want to talk about. And I said, I said this one earlier. I want to talk about a real-life example of what I think about, and this applies to my, my fish, my classroom fish. No, what I calculate is how long does it take for his water temperature to actually get back to normal so I can, re like, I can actually put him in a new bowl. This is something that I think about because water temperature shrinks exponentially. You know, it starts to warm up to the room temperature like over time, and then it just stops, right? It gets to room temperature. Well, what I think about is what is his temperature at the, that current moment, roughly? You know, I kind of guesstimate what's coming out of the faucet at. Um, and then how long would it take me to get to room temperature? How long would it take me to warm up or cool down? You actually do this math. So, yeah, you can actually do the math, and you can actually figure out it'll take me 20 hours. It'll take me the next three hours, depending on how warm the water is. Um, usually, I'm, I'm always on the safe side. I always go way longer than it says. Should you? What's, so, what do you think is easier to take hot water to cool it or cold water to warm it? Mm. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying cold water to boil. Yeah. No, but it's not like no. I'm because saying like, the, I'm saying like the temperature you can you can influx the temperature to to get hot water to go cold. You have to go by whatever the room temperature is. With the heat source that I have, I can go any any temperature that I need. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I'm saying like. Okay, so if you had like, like on a flame if, versus you had, if you had like no, ten degree different water, like say this is like thirty three degrees and this is like oh you know, you're saying go both directions? Yeah. Oh. Like what would or would be I would assume it'd probably be the same. If they're the same temperature, like same difference. I would assume it's the same. What do you normally do? You do normally put cold water in there, or like? Yeah, it's usually too cold, too cold, too cold water, and I need to get back to room temperature, seventy degrees, something like that. Whatever this room is, eighty. I don't know what the room is. Usually it's seventy-ish. Okay. All right. So here's the here's the formula that I have. Okay, and it's the same formula they used. It's actually, um, it's actually called Newton's law of cooling. That's actually the formula that's used. Okay. Here it is. Newton had a law for everything. Yeah, he he really did. Um. Okay. All right. Mr. Ward, you need to make a law. Me? Yes. He was trying to make a law. Okay. All right. Mr. Ward's law. Let's form out. All right. You didn't write the law. Newton's law of cooling. The sentinel needs people of Newton's law of cooling. Okay. So, okay, what this is, this is, uh, this is to get a formula where you have an initial temperature, you have an initial temperature, and you need to cool down um, an, actual, um, an actual tank of some sort and get it to the desired temp. This is the desired temp that I need to get it to, okay? 
And this is the initial temp that we're starting at. And the idea is that this number is how far we're cooling. So maybe, you know, the difference in cooling, maybe I gotta go 20 degrees. Maybe I gotta go more than that, okay? So we'll talk about like the growth, okay? All right, so let's say, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna make up some numbers here and we'll kind of, we'll kind of play on it, but I'm gonna use a, um, an estimated time, okay? So let's say that for a desired temp, let's say that a desired temp for my room, I wanna get my water to 70 degrees so I can put my fish in, okay? But out of the tap, the initial temp that I get out of the tap 58. is 58. Let's go 58, okay? 58 degrees, okay? So that means that I need to cool my, or actually warm up my water, in fact, by what, 12 degrees to get it there? So I'll need to, I'll need, I'll need to go up by 12 degrees to get it to the desired temp. So it looks like my E will actually have to grow. So the K in my case will actually be positive, okay? And maybe I know that, um, and why it's not negative is because um, we're, we're, going, we're going up, not down. So I'm going from 58 degrees initially to 70, so my K should be positive in the end. Um, my T, my time, maybe I know that it works in 24 hours. Like, I just know for a fact, like, in 24 hours, I know I can get it there. Like, I just guarantee it. It's like something that I just know for a fact, if I, leave, if I pour the wire in there right now, in 24 hours from now, like when I come in tomorrow, it'll work. It'll like it'll be the right temperature. I don't need to even test it. it it'll be the exact temperature. This will give me a growth, and then I can use that if I ever to change the water. Maybe I pulled water out of my fridge that's way colder, but maybe because maybe the power went out, so I can't like get water out of the fountain. Yeah, the so thing. now I can use the same formula, the same growth, and know exactly how long it will take for that water to be fine to be safe. Now, normally I don't worry about it, I just go 24, but this gives me a realistic model if I had different temperature of water. Um, so, um, how you do this, you, you'd Does actually subtract the volume of water these. matter, Mr. Ward? It's um, got, in, in, this, so cool. in this particular formula, it really doesn't. Which, because um, the water temperature itself will actually cool at the same rate, as long as it's in a controlled environment. So, what I mean by amount is that the amount that I initially did my test on has to be the same as the new test. So it's not like I can go like do this test and then go to Lake Michigan and go, oh, it's gonna cool off to this temperature in the next 10 hours. The, the body of water was different from my initial temp size. So the test size, the control matters. Like I'm doing a fishbowl, not Lake Michigan. Well, I'm talking like a bathtub. Yeah, bathtub, fine. If you did your test initially on a bathtub and you came in the next day and did it on the same bathtub, you're fine. It'll, the formula will work for that yeah, size. So yeah, so you got this rate won't apply to all. Yeah, so it's got it's got to apply to the test subject that you're working with. Um, so in this case, we subtract. This is 46 e to the k times 24 plus 12 equals 70. We subtract this across. It's 58 equals 46 e to the 24 k. We'll subtract. The, or we'll divide the, the 46 across. And now I can actually figure out the growth. So if we take the natural log of both sides, it'll be the natural log of this side. It'll be natural log of the other side, which the power will drop down and it'll cancel out the E and divide by 24. And what this number will be, this number will be the actual growth, or it'll be the actual <coughs> number that I need. This will be my growth or my cooling rate for that particular body of water. So, natural log, 58, divided by 46, close that parenthesis, divided by 24. My cooling rate is this. This is my cooling rate. That, per hour? So I'm going up or down depending on what I need. So this is, yeah, this is over a 24 hour period. So this is, this is based in days basically, like one day, it's gonna, it's gonna cool at that rate. So if I come in with a different temperature for my water, my initial temp is off, that's fine. I can still figure out how long I need because now I know my growth rate. And so that, that number never changed, it's about the same. That's actually pretty accurate. I, I had I had it as about point 
uh, seven, somewhere in that range when I initially did it. But I don't really worry about it. This is something I wouldn't worry about. It's something that I did years ago when I initially calculated it. Wait, what do you think the actual amount of time it would take though? Because like 24 hours is definitely a way, way longer. Um, this, in this particular example, I think it could have been about, about six, seven hours, something like that. I could do it from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. I don't want to do that. I just don't want to risk him. Yeah. Well, because what's even like, by degree, he can he can die. Yeah. What oh, with a degree? Yeah, with a degree. I was gonna say, I wonder what That's why goldfish have really low life expectancies when you drop them into a new bowl, because if they're off by a few degrees, like if goldfish is way more tolerance, they die pretty quick. Really. So. What fish is like really tolerable? Really tolerable? Yeah. Um. The. Uh, what is that stupid lake fish? Uh, the bullhead. Oh, really? Mike, they could go 10, 12 degrees. Like, it wouldn't even matter. Like, just throw him in an ice bucket and he's fine. He'll swim around for a while. Really? Yeah. Wait, how does, wait when all, stupid fish. wouldn't lake fish be like that? Though? Because yeah. But their, their tender gradually gets there over winter and fall and spring. But I'm talking like shock moment. Yeah. Still like, surviving, stupid. Why do they die? Is it because, like, um, their body goes into shock, basically. Heart rate they, accelerates. Is it because of this change? Or like the change. 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 Could he withstand the change? Carl Frederick Goss. What? He's a mathematician. Carl Frederick Goss. He's a mathematician. Yeah. I probably should know about it. You know anything about it? You got and any information on it? Alright. All right, but there you go. That's it for today. So